even though it may not seem like it, we are, we're still talking indirectly, as I told you we were this year, about doing. Uh, we are looking at it from the perspective of trust, because you can't do without trust. Um, and that's right, that's, that's, well, what is it? That comes out meaning two different things. You can't do without it, and you can't be a doer without it, right? Um, not without trust. It's the one thing that Jesus is looking for. It's the one thing that God is looking for. And to be honest with you, as best as I can see, as we read through the scriptures, it was the one thing that even started this whole creation was an issue of trust. I mean, when Lucifer questioned the trustworthiness of God. He breathed those thoughts into the mind of Adam and Eve, and they questioned the trustworthiness of the heart of God. Uh, ironically, out of all of the entities in all of the universe, and outside of the universe, that should never be questioned as to his motives and his trustworthiness, who should never, ever be on trial, is the one who has been on trial since before the foundation of this planet was laid. And the jury doesn't have to be out. We can come in with a solid verdict in each one of our lives that he is indeed trustworthy. Amen? We, and that is, that's really what this life is about. Because if he is trustworthy, then we'll let him take his place. The very place that Satan questioned whether God had the right to in the first place. And that was a place, or does he have the right to rule and to reign? And I'd say that the answer to that question is yes. 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 Absolutely. He's got the right to rule and to reign. So we've uh, th just a quick review over um, uh, some of the high points that we've been talking about. The Holy Spirit speaks, and when he speaks, he tells us with urgency, today here. This is a, that gives, it gives a sense of urgency. Don't wait. Don't be a lazy here. Right? Don't be a lazy here. The, it's imperative that today is the day, which also tells me, number one, he's speaking today, and number two, you can hear if you want to hear. I mean, that's all I can get out of that. I don't know about you. But the word today doesn't look like it's offering the option for tomorrow. He's not saying, I'm speaking today, here when you get around to it. Obviously, I've got the ability, it's resonant on the inside of me to do the hearing today. Amen? And so that's, that's a major point. And who is it that's telling us this? Who is it that's urging the reality and the importance and the urgency of this upon our souls? but the Holy Spirit himself, the one who is just like the one who left. I am sending you another helper, comparable to myself, right? Amen? Amen. And when he comes, he will lead you and guide you into all truth. He's going to take of mine and reveal it to you. And everything that I had came from Papa, and so I'm telling you, he's going to take of mine and reveal it to you. The Holy Spirit speaks, and he says, today. Also, the next point is hearing his voice is a choice. And I kind of got to marry that with the top one. Hearing his voice is a choice. You know, it's very, very easy to get caught up in the mechanics of things. It's very, very easy. Uh, we, we were talking this morning in our, in our time of, uh, of just communion and praising uh, God for the things that he's done. Um, not just Nancy, but with a few others in here. About, you know, uh, God speaking uh, or God leading, but then us uh, being in a position of God, I just want to, I just want to hear and I just want to go forward and I just want to do. And we begin to get our attention so much on the moving forward that we don't settle and listen. We don't allow ourselves to hear. The, ver the very, very fact that initially we had an impress in our heart that he was doing something, that he was moving, that tells us right there, you were already hearing. Whatever you were doing to hear there, don't change. See, what we, when as soon as we begin to sense the Spirit of God moving, we get all, oh, okay, I don't, want to, I don't want to lose that. I want to make sure I'm diligent. I want to do this. I want to do that. And we get so involved in it that God's like, okay, never mind. <sighs> I was trying to talk to you, right? Uh, you know, it, it, I mean, what were you doing when the voice came? Probably nothing too terribly important. Probably you were just like Moses. You just happened to be walking by a bush and taking care of sheep. And God showed up. Right? Yeah. Maybe like Jacob, you had your head lay on a rock for a pillow. And God was there and you did not know it. Right? Yeah, right. 
I mean, remember in, in, in the book uh, that we read with uh, the pursuit of God from Tozer, that, you know, taught that whole chapter that's about the universal presence, right? And that God is always present in all of his creation, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just saying it, from the mountain top to the ocean floor, Amen. God's everywhere. Yeah. Amen. The problem is we don't know it, yeah. right? Yeah. We don't have to get in closer to God, not in proximity. You can't get closer to God. He's everywhere. David even said, if I were to make my bed in hell, behold, you would be there. Wow. There's no place he's not. So, you know, um, what if, in that same passage, what did David say? Where could I flee from your spirit? Where could I go? It was a rhetorical question. I can't go anywhere that you're not. Right? I can't think a thought that you didn't know it altogether. Nothing original, and I can't go anywhere. Another, another place it says that everything is open and naked before the eyes of whom we must give an account. We just think we're hiding. We just think we're well hidden. You're not well hidden. The only person that's being well hidden is God from your view, but not from his presence. Right? What we want is the manifest presence. Not just the fact of his presence, but the manifestation of it. Right? And that comes, number one, it comes as God wills in some respects, and it also comes as we acknowledge that he's already here. Right? Jacob, you know, I like the response that Jacob gave in some respects. Some of it was lacking. We've already acknowledged that when we were going through looking at the other week on Wednesday, as we've been looking at the Bible. But one of the things I like about Jacob's response was he didn't get all tied up in, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? He just acknowledged, hey, you were here, and I didn't know it. Right? And that, that, was, that was, he was taking a step, right? And God entered into the conversation. Jacob didn't get all uptight about, oh, I don't want to mess up this opportunity. But when we get that way, we mess up that opportunity. You know what I mean? Nothing messes up the opportunity like focusing on not messing up the opportunity. <laughs> That's right. You know what I mean? Because why, 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 what is it that changes when we do that? Our focus is on our behavior. What, what do I do? And God's like, this wasn't about, this whole conversation didn't start with you doing. What makes you think it's going to progress to the next step by you doing something? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Right? This is not relying upon you. This is relying upon me. But you're going to, the only thing that's relying upon you is you resting and trusting that I want to I want to bring you to where I want to bring you more than you want to go there. You're not happy. You, you realize we do treat it this way sometimes. God comes to us and speaks to us. He stirs something in us that before was dormant or latent or had never existed. And we get all eager and gun ho and want to make it happen. And now it, it's, it's, it's like in our heads, the, 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 the entire paradigm is shifted. And now I'm trying to drag God to get him to help me do what he's the one that started. Amen. And all the while, it's, it's completely the other way around. God's like, you know what? You know, I'm the one that initiated this. And I'm the one that will bring it to completion. What I need you to do is just rest. And, and maybe shut up a little. <laughs> right? But rest. I want this more than you do. Or I wouldn't have brought it to you in the first place. Amen? Are you guys following? Yes. So, but hearing is a choice. We also learn that unbelief is evil. Now, you and I dress it up all kinds of ways and give us all kinds of excuses, and we hide. Well, it was because of this. It was because I had a bad childhood. It was because of that. It was because of the... No, 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 no. Evil. No, no. Evil, evil. When it shows up in me, it's evil. When it shows up in you, it's evil. It's just evil. Any time that our heart is not inclined to trust our Father, it's evil. Well, that just, okay, I got at least something. <laughs> I know that's an exciting word. You guys were just waiting to show up to hear that one. But it is the truth. I mean, we read in Romans, it tells us that whatever is not produced from faith is sin. Well, that, that kind of, that just kind of mops my floor. I don't know about you, you know? I, mean, I got all kinds of stuff I do that's not entirely based in trust. Well, then there's a lot of sin going on, right? 
That, does, that, does that condemn me? Of course it doesn't. All it does is, what it ought to do is stir me to rest. Right? That's the reason why, remember, Hebrews tells us, it, it is a labor to enter into the rest. You're going to have to quit fidgeting. We are fidgety people. You know? It, you know, I mean, just like a cat and a dog pound. And God's like, you know, just rest. Just rest. I brought it to you. I'll bring you through. Right? But don't, don't, you, don't you take the reins. If you take the reins, it's already messed up before we get started. Right? Now, you know, going back one more to the hearing his voice, I just want being a choice, I want to remind us, I did write this down, that, you know, Jesus in his statements regularly said, he who has ears to hear, let him. Right? But then later on, we also learned that uh, hearing includes the idea of heeding and obeying, which requires faith. When he says, heed my voice, do you think he just means hear it? Or do you think included in that is obey it? Okay. And if obeying isn't part of it, is part of it, then trust has to be part because I can't obey without trust. So in the word hear my voice is an invitation to surrender to my direction and let it live itself through you by trusting me. Right? It's not an invitation to try more and to buck up, try harder, or to prove anything, or to drag God, to get him. It's like, like I said a minute ago, it's like we think that, that God is suffering from, uh, you know, some form of, of Alzheimer's or something. He brings up something that forgot he brought it up, you know. He brings us to something, stirs something in our heart, and now it's our job to stir God into being interested to make it happen. It's like, no, 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 no. I, I brought, I'm the one that brought this up. You know, who was it that started this conversation? It wasn't you. I had this on my mind and brought it to you. I'm the one that stirred you. You don't have to get me interested. I was interested. That's why I showed up. Just believe, see, we immediately off, every single one of these steps requires trust. The first step is as soon as he stirs something inside of the heart, trust right then. Whatever it is that you're wanting to do, you're going to make it clear. And I'm going to be able to do it. I trust that. Yeah. I trust that. I trust that. And, and maybe for the first day, two, three, four, five, that whole time, you might just be trying to convince yourself that you trust that. But you know what? Just continue to steer your heart that way. I'm going to trust that. I'm going to trust that. Then the thought starts coming in your mind. Well, you need to do this. Well, maybe you need to do that. Maybe you weren't doing enough of this. And you know, all that, it's all, it's all the devil coming in with puppet strings. You're like, no, 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 no. See, you're trying to get me to not trust in another area. You're trying to get me to believe that if I was doing those things wrong, the Holy Spirit wouldn't bother to tell me. But I don't believe that either. I believe that not only is he going to lead me, but if I was doing something that's going to sabotage this, the Holy Spirit would tell me. I trust that too. I'm not, gonna, I'm not buying it. I'm not jumping in there and I'm not going to do anything. I'm not messing this up. I'm not concerned about it. God's got the reins, and I'm going to let him steer the ship. I'm done. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust. I'm just trusting. I'm just trusting. And then turn your, you know, like I've said before, many times you could do a whole lot worse than turning your attention towards worship. Just begin to worship him. And isn't that really, uh, in the end, a lot of what rejoicing is? And what did Paul tell us? You know, rejoice. Always. Always. <laughs> I got you with your mouthful, sorry. <laughs> always. So that it's good advice. Rejoice always. And again, I'm telling you, rejoice. Right? Yeah. Then he goes on and says, be anxious for nothing. 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 Absolutely nothing. But in everything, come to your Father, make your request known, and then trust Him. And then peace will flood your heart. If peace isn't flooding your heart, you miss something in that list. And it's not a long list. It's not a comprehensive list. It's not a hard list. Right? Yes. I think of the old hymn. Trust and obey. There's no other, no other way. way. Yeah. Trust Absolutely. Trust Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. No other way to be happy in Jesus. That's a fact. Amen. But then to trust and obey. Then you have peace. So, yes, you do. Uh, so unbelief is evil. It just is. Then we talk about encouraging one another towards belief and works or good works. I mean, obviously, the works need to be good. You don't want to encourage each other to bad works. So, encouraging one another. Now, this encouraging one another is, uh, is an important one because 
not only is it uh, uh, is it part of our job as being born again, but uh, it's a, you know it's a convenient lie of man-made religion that um, we can spiritually be in park. There is no park. There is no neutral. That's a religious idea. It, it really is. The truth is that if you are not moving forward, you're going backwards. I mean, there is no park. Amen. We, we make that up. We, it's a convenient thing that man has made up in religion, but it's not really true. It's a lie. There's not, if there's not an ongoing relationship of hearing and trusting and obeying, then your relationship with God is more marked by ignoring unbelief and disobedience. It's that simple. It really is. And, and I've had large stretches of time in my life where the latter has been more true to me than the former. But, you know, I'm not going to get better if I don't acknowledge it. And it's not saying something, it's not, it's not a bad confession, it's just saying the truth. Right? I mean, it, it, you start getting better when you acknowledge and lay hold on the fact that, well, yeah, I, I have been doing that right. Right? I'm pressing forward and I'm trusting. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm diverting a little bit from the from the encouraging one because of the encouraging one another because this stuff is coming to me as I'm saying it. So we're kind of kind of floating here. Um, I wanted to also bring up to you. Remember, we mentioned in John chapter five, verse forty six and forty seven that um, part of trusting begins with it, Jesus said, "You know, if you will not hear what Moses wrote, you won't hear what I say." Right. If we don't have an inclination to believe what God wrote, we will not have an inclination to believe what he says to us. Hello? I mean, would you not see how that applies? Jesus himself is right in front of them, and he says, every word that I say is coming right from God the Father, right to your ears, from God the Father's mouth through mine to your ears, right? And he said, if you don't believe what you've written, what was written about me from Moses, how will you believe what I say to you? Right? If you can't believe, if you're not inclined to trust what I've already said, what makes you think you're going to trust if I say something fresh? Yeah. Right? So now, another, the next step, of course, like I said, is encouraging one another. And again, it's associated with the word today. Sin lend, uh, uh, leads us to hardness, and godly encouragement turns us from it. Walking in love like this requires you to know your brother. And make them a priority in your life. Now this is effectively taking your time and your attention away from yourself. And it has a dual effect of saving both you and your brother. I'll say that again. It has a dual effect of saving both you and your brother. Because your attention is finally off of you. Right? Yes. Your brother's going to have to become a priority in your life. Your sister's going to have to become a priority in your life. And when it does, we, I mean, tell you what, you can do a whole lot worse than love. Isn't that right? The next one is, you have dwelt long enough at this mountain. And I think that definitely applies here in this group. We've dwelt long enough at this mountain. Right? Long enough. You know, a number of years ago when we first started talking about faith again, re-examining our thoughts and, and re-examining how we approached trust towards God and, and actually redefining some things, faith getting the, the term a relational trust and other things like that, that, that faith is, is, is in God, not for something and all that. When we were spending time with those things and the need to hear from God, um, you know, I'll just tell you what I saw from my perspective looking out was at first there was a certain amount of excitement because it was something new. Then there was this um, blank look of, oh, wait a minute. You mean I can't just go back and just say if I need wisdom, I'm just going to quote James 4 um, or James uh, 1. Or you mean if I need this, I can't just go back and just sling this scripture. And if I, if I, if I need this, I can't just sling that scripture. Uh, you're saying I have to actually step up to the plate and have a relationship with God? Actually talk to him and hear him? Well, that's not what I signed up for when I came here. I came for control. I can find a verse and throw it and know I'm good. And you know, and I asked every one of you, and I, I tell you, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was borderline funny, because I remember asking one of the key core, first questions I asked was, how many of you have confessed and confessed and confessed and confessed and confessed and confessed and confessed to Scripture, and nothing, nothing, nothing ever changed? And and 
what, instead of looking at me and raising hands, people begin to look to the left and the right and say, who's going to be the first one to raise their hand? You know? I, I remember one of the first ones, uh, just probably because he was in my view, Jim used to sit right where you are, uh, Jim went literally like this. <laughs> then another hand went up and another hand went up and another hand that went up. We're like, well, you know, well, maybe, I don't know, just maybe we're doing something wrong, right? Well, you know, but, but this whole thing about you dwell long enough at this mountain, go forward and trust. Real trust, not make-believe trust, not, not the kind of trust that just sees what God said to somebody else and tries to throw that at my problem, but actually, you know, allowing what God said to somebody else to be an invitation towards a conversation with God. And, and again, I'm not saying that, that what God said to somebody else should not create general trust in your heart. Of course it should. Absolutely. If God has done this historically for everyone else, you are on very good ground that he's going to do it for you. So yes, you ought to trust that. Amen? Without question. You should go into this anticipating with expectation, great expectations, right? Yes. But, but the conversation hasn't even really truly entirely started yet, right? This is an invitation towards a conversation with God, amen? Mm -hmm. and, and begin to engage him on that level. Don't live at that mountain. But I think that when we first begin to see this, it was uh, the, the thoughts that I was seeing was, that's not what I signed up for. But, you know, yeah, you did. If you came to Jesus, that's what you signed up for. <laughs> I know we didn't all know that because it didn't come with the brochure, I know. But, you know, it, but it really is, you know. It really is. Has anybody ever um, uh, bought a package, God forbid, a vacation package, and then, um, or something like that, and then when you actually get it, it's way different than the words made it sound like it was going to be. You know what I mean? Well, you know, a, a lot of times <laughs> salvation is sold to people wrapped up with this big fat bowl that makes them think that salvation is something different than it really is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, we, and I just got done talking the other day uh, to um, uh, the some of the young men over there at Loving Hands, and that's one of the things the Lord led me to talk to them about was that, you know, some of them are going to go out and become preachers. And you have to be careful how you present the gospel. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a gospel of man. It's not about man. It's about God. And if, you're, if your gospel is all man-focused then you're going to be all kinds of screwed up and lost when, and you'll have no context for what's going on in your life because you'll find that life really isn't all about you. And so you're like, well, this isn't lining up with what I thought the gospel was. You know, I signed up for a God that was all about me. And while God is for you, his actions are never just about you. If he made you the basis for his actions, he would be making you his God. And that will never happen. He does what he does because it's true of who he is. He acts out of the solitude of who he is. He does what he does out of respect to the other members of the Godhead. He does not do what he do, uh, does because of the fact that you are the very the only thing that is being considered here. Are you following? Yes. Now you can be grateful that God so loves. And so therefore you are on his radar. But you're, you know, I, I, another thing that came to my mind when I was talking to them the other day was you would think by the way the gospel was preached that, for, that John 3.16 says because man, was so, because man was so lost and his need was so great, God sent his son. But it doesn't say that. It said because God loved them, because God so loved, he said. You know, it wasn't man's need that moved God. It was his heart that moved God. Are you seeing? But we teach a gospel that's man-centered. It's because of my need. It's because of this. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's Mark-centered. God is not Mark-centered. And you can be grateful that he's not you-centered. One of the things that gives stability to God is that he has to operate from who he is, which does not change. Mark changes regularly. Yes. And so would God if I was his God. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't work this way. It's very, very important that we recognize that. It's huge. There are some, there's something to be said about being faithful over what you have so that more can be given. There's something to be said about being faithful over what you already have, right? Yes. If God has already moved in your life, if he's already spoken to you, if he's already given you his word, then at that point, if you will be faithful over what you already have, more will be given, right? That's right. And we've seen that pattern in James. And James, the first chapter, tells us um, uh, 
rejoice, my brother, when you fall into various temptations, oppositions, trials against your trust in God. Knowing that the, 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 um, the, um, the opposition against your trust produces patience, and patience approved character, right? He said, but you know what? But later on, he says, he says, blessed are those who endure temptation, for when they have been proved, when they have been proved, what is he talking about? Proved worthy of the word I received. Well, what was this temptation coming from? For the word was so, yes. and the devil comes immediately to take it away. Oh, yes. Right? Were you worthy of the investment of Jesus that was placed in you? God doesn't just cast His pearl before swine, so you can already be grateful He's talking to you. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. I'm grateful that God opens His lips and talks to Mark. You know what I mean? Amen. That means Mark's not a swine. I'm grateful for that. You know what I mean? <laughs> God talks to me. But when he makes a deposit, that deposit is a deposit of the person of Christ. It's not facts. It's a person. Right? Amen. And, that, and that seed of Jesus Christ that was deposited in me, when it grows up, what's, it, what's the fruit going to be? Jesus in me. Right? So, but if I'm not faithful over that that was given to me, what makes me think he's going to continue to scatter seed in that field? Right? So as I'm faithful over that word, it says, blessed are those who endure opposition against what God deposited in their heart. Because when they have been proved, they will be honored with knowing God. Thank you, God. That's right. Because you were faithful over the last thing God revealed to you, God will honor you with knowing more about him. Right? Knowing him intimately more. That's the progression. That's the way it works. You'll be honored. You'll be crowned with life. Now, we are told that even though Israel saw God's works, they would not be persuaded. Now, so there's, there's another level of unbelief. And unfortunately, I think that this latter one is actually more prevalent in the body of Christ and even in us. And that is, we're not talking a about a person who upon first hearing didn't believe. We're talking about a person that regardless of how much they're exposed to will not be persuaded. There's a difference between the two. Are you following me? Yes. There's a big difference between the two. This is, it was because of that kind of unbelief that their bodies fell in the wilderness and God was not well pleased with that generation. Right? I'm not going to be that. I'm going to be well pleasing to him. I'd like it if you came along with me. Right? I'm going to be well pleasing to him. You know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm no longer, I, I know we're saying it this morning, but you know, I've gotten to the point where I'm, I'm, the Lord's pulling me beyond that line of saying, it's my desire to honor you. Uh, what I hear God saying is, well, then just do it. Quit wanting it. Just do it. It's real easy. Isn't it easy to raise our hand and get all emotional and fury and all that? I want to honor you, God. And that's great, but do it. Don't just talk about it. Don't just have the emotion flowing through you. It's great that you feel it, but do it. My life is an honoring you. Yes, exactly. My life is an honoring of you, that's right? right. And, the, and the song does go on to say that. But, but, you know, but it's easy to, I mean, I don't know how many times I've, I've sat there before, God's like, God, I just want to honor you. I just, and, and it's true, it was a genuine desire. But, you know, eventually I just begin to hear this in my heart. I just say, well, then do it. Do it. You know, quit, quit talking about how much you want to do it and just do it. And, you know, it, 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 as ridiculous as it sounds, that really had never occurred to me. Oh. You, you mean Now. Yeah, now would be a good time to start it. <laughs> just do it, right? You know, quit talking about wanting to honor me. Just do it. Now, you, then at that point, you won't have to say, Lord, I want to. You can say, thank you, Father God, that, that the Holy Spirit is honoring you through my life. Amen. I feel honored, right? It changes everything, doesn't it, right? Show me more. <laughs> yes, amen. <laughs> so we're told that even though Israel saw God's works, they would not be persuaded. A, a quote from that is, it says, Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, Their hearts were drawn away and they would not know my ways. Now I know that in Psalm 103 it tells us that God made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. But it's not because God wasn't willing to make known his ways to Israel. It's because that they would not know it. Right? There was a difference in the heart of a Moses and a Joshua and a Jacob than there was with the rest of the hearts, wasn't there? Right? And because, becoming callous of heart 
happens to those who develop ears for hearing other voices. Becoming callous of heart happens to those who develop ears for hearing other voices. And one of the primary voices that we heed is our own heart's desire to protect itself from disappointment. One of the greatest voices that we heed is our own voice that tells us to protect our heart from disappointment. We don't want to step out and find out we were wrong. Oh, to be a Peter. Right? Yes. I don't think that Peter rarely, I, don't, I think Peter rarely ever had that thought occur to him. He was out in the middle of the water before he considered the first what if. Now, he did consider what if, but he was already walking before he did it. But for so many in the body of Christ, it keeps them from taking the first step out the boat. They never get off the boat. And even in that example, don't we see it? How many were still in the boat? All of the rest of them. The only one out of all of them got out. Isn't it true? Yes. And notice it was, it was Peter's desire to draw near to the Lord. Lord, if it is you, bid me to come. Right? Bid me to come to you. And Jesus is like, come. Have you ever thought about the faith that was in Jesus? It never occurred to him that he couldn't walk on the water. It never occurred to him that he couldn't just tell Peter, come. We're like, well, he was God. No, 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 wait a minute. No, Jesus came as a human with all, not part, not some, all of the limitations of being a human. And he said to Peter, come. Yes. I just want to interject this. This is probably a stupid time to do it. But um, years ago, we were over at the pool. Mm -hmm. Joshua was pretty young yet. Mm -hmm. And he stood at the side of the pool, mm -hmm. and he says, I'm going to walk on the water. Uh -huh. And I, he was so matter-of-fact about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Michelle, she said, he said, Peter did it. Mm -hmm. And Michelle said, yes, he did. He <laughs> says, and I can do it. And he stood, he stepped out in the hot water, believing mm -hmm. he was going to walk across that water. Well, when he stepped out on the water, mm -hmm. he went underwater. Uh -huh. But when he came up out of the water, he turned around and said, I took one step on top of the water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, there was no... Discouragement. He, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was bound. Mm -hmm. He was not discouraged. You know, I mean, his faith... That's a lesson was, we should all learn. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it just was so matter-of-fact. Mm -hmm. I can do it. Peter did it. I took one step on the water. <laughs> And it, you know, it, for, for him, it was a success. Yes. He didn't mm -hmm. care that he didn't go across school. Uh -huh. Though that would have been fun. Still. That yes. would have been fun. <laughs> but I mean, he's, you know, I mean, he has done other things, you know. Mm -hmm. God said, do it. I did it. And, mm -hmm. no big, you know, I mean, it's a big deal. Yeah. And that's, see, having a, having a Peter kind of heart is a good thing. Are you following? Yeah. So uh, yeah. now the, um, the next one is being faithful. What you have is, um, was, yeah, call us hard. Okay, I guess we did cover all those. So let's go ahead and go to the next one. Um, this is the last of the ones that we covered, and that is faith comes by hearing. But how does God speak? And we're going to spend some time with that this morning. We looked last week at Romans 10 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and determined that faith comes by hearing. Um, not just that uh, we were looking at to see whether or not faith comes by hearing just for salvation, as a lot of commentators insinuate, especially by using those two passages. But, you know, I think if we look at the greater context of Scripture, then over and over and over and over again, what we see is that faith literally comes when God speaks. Um, uh, and, and, and that makes sense because the fact that the Spirit of God tells us, in that same passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, um, tells us that uh, um, no man can know the thoughts of God except for the Spirit of God. So how can you trust what's in God's heart if you don't know what's in God's heart? Right? That requires communication, doesn't it? 
Yes or no? Yes. I mean, no man knows the things of the Spirit of God, but the, uh, the things that are in God except for the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might know. Right? So, so clearly, what I get out of that passage is that faith does come by hearing and that God is eager to speak. In fact, He is speaking. Problem is, do we hear? Right? Well, we're developing years to hear. And one of the ways that we develop it is it starts, before you can get to trust, you start with trust. You start with it. God's spoken to me in the past. What makes me think he's not going to speak to me now? Why would God fill his passage, his scriptures, with, with today, listen to my voice, if today he's not speaking in a way that I can hear him? Why would Jesus say, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the, the good shepherd and my sheep hear my voice if I don't hear his voice? So I'm starting off believing that I hear him. I don't care whether that's part of your experience yet. <coughs> Salvation wasn't part of your experience before you got born. Again, you had to believe before you got it. Right? Well, this is the same thing. I believe that I'm going to hear before I hear. Are you seeing what I'm saying? I go into it with trust. I go into it believing that God really does care. God really does want to speak. That he is, like Joe Dozier says, articulate in his universe. He is not, uh, you know, God, you know, religion is crippled, Tozier said, by the fact that they, they think that, that the word of God is the re representation of, of what God had to say when he was for a brief moment in a speaking mood. Well, you know, that's where you get the deadness of religion. But God was not at one time in a speaking mood. He's never stopped talking. It's just part of what he said was written down. We don't even have everything that Jesus said. We know he said more than was written and read. John said, if, I tell you that if all the things that Jesus said and did were written down, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain all that happened. So we know that just because it's not written doesn't mean that God didn't speak and isn't speaking, right? Isn't it true? So we, we conclude the fact that it is true that God is, in fact, speaking. And that hearing is, um, is the way in which we wind up generating trust. We concluded that it was, it was um, uh, let's see, hold on. Um, in Romans 10, verse 21, it says, but, Israel sa but to Israel God said, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. God stretching out his hand and God speaking to them was very much the same thing. See, part of the problem is that we're, we're, we're gridlocked into thinking God has to come to me a certain way. And it was, that was addressed this morning. Uh, you, you mentioned that, right? And God's not gridlocked into coming to, a certain, to us a certain way. God can come to us a number of different ways. Remember I told you last week that unless you have a heart like J Joshua or Caleb, what God does and what you think he is doing will be two radically different things. God brought them to the mountain. After he said, you've dwelt long enough around this one, let me take you to another mountain, the one that is in the promised land that you can take in and possess. And when they brought, he brought them to that mountain, people had different eyes and different ears. They saw something different and they heard something different. God was saying something not just by go and possess it, but he was seeing, saying something by bringing them to. Do you think it was a mistake that God brought them to the one group in all of the Canaanite area that had giants in it? Yeah. That that was by accident? No. He could have brought them to the smallest area with the least populated area, with the least fortified area, with people that were the same size as they were or smaller. <laughs> he could have if they were there. But what did he choose to do? He deliberately steered them to the mountain that was impossible. Yeah. Why did he do that? Well, you know, we have two things. I didn't intend to get into this today, and I'm, I'm not going to because I don't even completely fully understand it, but I'll submit it to you today. The devil tempts in order to draw you away from trust and to prove that you do not trust. God tests your faith to prove or give you an opportunity to prove you do trust. Are you seeing? Yeah. There's a difference between the two. The motives are radically different. Yeah. The methods are radically different. I'll bring up one in a minute here that illustrates how God does it. And you know how the devil does it. The devil does it by questioning the integrity of God. Right. When God does it, he's never questioning his own integrity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? The problem is that when we walk up to the mountain, we make assumptions about God's integrity. Are you following? Yes. Okay. And we'll, we'll deal with that as we go today. But uh, 
So the Joshua's and the Caleb said, let us take the land for we are well able. And the rest of them said, it's because the Lord hates us that he brought us out to destroy us. God was speaking the same thing to everyone and yet they heard something different, didn't they? God complains in Numbers 14, 22. You say God complains? Yes, God complains. But see, when God does it, it's legitimate. He's got a good reason for it. When we do it, we're just usually wallowing. But God complains in Numbers 40, 14, verse 22. He says, Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, Therefore, they're not going to go in the promised land, right? But listen to what he said here. Because all these men who have done what? Seen my glory. The signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness. What was the voice he was speaking by? The things he did. The things he did. Those were his voice. And they would... And that's what he says right here, isn't it? They did not heed what he called his voice. But what did he pull out? What did he point to as being the mechanism of his voice? The things he did. He said, that's my voice. Oh, gosh, I'll tell you, if you didn't, guys didn't walk away with anything else but that today, it would be worth showing up. Yeah. That's, right. that's my voice. I'm not saying it's God's only voice, but it's one of them. Yes. Right? What were these ten examples? Well, you know, you can pull from a lot of them, but I, 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 I went to the scriptures and I looked, uh, and I looked also on the internet, and I came up with a, a composite of things that could easily be some of which we know for a fact because it says God was they were testing God at the time. But um, I'm, we're going to look at them. But before we look at them, I want to read um, Exodus chapter thirteen, verse seventeen through twenty-two. You can turn if you want to, or just let me read it. I don't care. Exodus thirteen, verse seventeen through twenty-two. It says, "Then it came to pass." When Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the Philistines, although that was near. It was closer. For God said, lest perhaps this people change their minds when they see war and return back to Egypt. God was protecting their faith already, wasn't he? Yeah. But at the same time, he needed them to be people of faith. So it was nearer to take, go to the left, but he chose to go to the right. I'm using those metaphorically. It could have been the other way around, but you know what I mean. He chose to go another way. Not because of that, the other way, the one way probably would have been better, it would have been nearer, it would have been closer, it would have been more convenient, but the problem is it would have provoked in you a response that, ah, I think maybe let's go back to Egypt. So instead he led them another way. You know, remember a while back, a while back, we, were, we read and we spent a, a, a considerable amount of time looking in Deuteronomy that says, pay attention to the way that I led you. Not just that I led you, but the way I led you. All these years through the wilderness, right? Well, here's one of the first examples, the first example. When they got out of Egypt and they could have taken a left or a right, God said, I'm going to go this way, and this is why. Because if they see war, their hearts are going to be inclined to go back to where I took them out of. Right? So God was protecting them, wasn't he? Yes. He had a way that he brought them. So God led them around by the way of the, the wilderness and the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had, uh, he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and, shall carry up, and you shall carry up my bones with you. So they took their journey from Succoth to the, um, and they camped in um, Etham at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them. Listen to this. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them in the way. And by night a pillar of fire to give them light so as, uh, so as to go by day and night. So whether they were going by day or by night, God was leading them. So from day one, was there any question as to who was taking them the direction they were going? No. No. So anything that we read in these next 10 things that they tested God with, know that they didn't just show up where they did by happenstance. God planted them there because they were following the cloud. Mm -hmm. Are you following? Mm -hmm. So even his leading was speaking to them. But they didn't have ears to hear. They made assumptions. And those assumptions were almost always evil. So let's look at them. First one is Israel had just been redeemed from slavery in Egypt by ten 
ridiculous miracles, the Passover and the shedding of blood of the Lamb, and now, but now they face Pharaoh's army behind them as they're facing the Red Sea. What is it that they heard? What is it that Israel believed? Something was being said here. But what do they hear? What do they believe? They said, you have brought us up from Egypt to kill us in the wilderness. In Exodus 14 and 11. That's what they saw. Now, what, what, how did God spoken to them? He just done at least well, more than 10 because even before it got to covering all of Egypt, God did, um, did um, uh, miracles in the presence of Pharaoh before his, his enchanters, right? Before his little wizards. And Moses's were always greater than theirs. Aaron's was always greater than theirs. But then, and the people had heard about that. But then, not only that, he did the ten that went all over Egypt, and yet their land was was safe. The bugs came up to the uh, to the border, and not any further. The darkness came up to the border, and no further. The blood in the Nile went up to there, and then it was pure water. Right? They'd seen this. Ten of them, rather impressive ones, by the way. God speaking. God speaking, God speaking. He brings them out of Egypt by a mighty hand laden down with the gold of Egypt. Pharaoh, out of his own mouth, lets them go. The Bible says that God caused them to be pitied by those who had carried them away captive. Wow. So not only were they going, but they were being pitied by the people who once had a whip on their back. Now they came too within a few days, right? And then they pursued them. But God had already spoken, hadn't he? Yes. Now, I know no words had been spoken specifically other than go out into the wilderness. But he'd shown his faithfulness and his desire to deliver them. Enough was spoken by God by his actions that they should have had some trust. But they did not, did they? And so what was the first way they tested God? Was by accusing him of, the, him of leading them out into the wilderness just to kill them. That's the first way they tested him. Then you got the second one. A short while later. We're not even talking about a long while. A short while later, when they approached the water pool at Mara, they expected sweet water because that's all they'd had in Egypt, right? And But when they got there, the water was bitter. What did they believe? Now remember, who led them to this bitter water? God did. Now if you keep on reading, you'll find that it was only a short distance from there that there were, was a, an, an oasis where there were 12 wells. And all kinds of palm trees for them to sit under and drink water. And instead of God taking them first to that place, to the, to the, to the Hilton, he took them to, you know, a campground that had bad water. He did it on purpose. Yes. Yes. It's not that he didn't know this was over here because he led them there afterwards. He led them here. And what, what, but what did they hear by God's voice? What did they say? They complained, what can we possibly drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast the tree into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. He tested them. Right? Yes. By bringing them deliberately to, to water that he knew was bad. Was it because God was just being nasty and being mean and trying to trick them? No. He's trying to evoke, do you trust me at all? Right? I mean, I mean, now they have another big one under their belt. God rose in this, this supernatural wall between them and their enemies, let them sleep overnight, split the Red Sea and caused them to cross over on dry land, and then destroyed all of their enemies in the sea. Right? I mean, and, and please, don't trust me. Go back and read this because you'll see that just... Just before this incident at Mara, everybody was singing and dancing with, with, uh, with Miriam, the prophetess, who, who by inspiration of the Holy Spirit sung a, an amazing, beautiful, prophetic song of the glories of God and His power and how He delivered us by a mighty hand. Oh, wait a minute, this water tastes bitter. Did you come take us out here to kill us? It's almost in the same breath. I mean, read the account of it yourself, not now, but later. You'll find there was, there was very little time between the, oh, you're great, and oh my God, you're trying to kill us. 
<laughs> You're like, well, I would never be that. Well, wait a minute. Just look at your life and don't look back far. Just look this week. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You may not be saying you're trying to kill me, but the answers that we often give are not ones that are based in trust. Not ones that are expecting that, well, yeah, I understand I might be at some bitter waters, but I'm expecting you're going to, you must be looking to do a miracle here. Right? Yes. We don't want to complain. God, that's, how, how many times have we seen in Scripture complaining doesn't work out well? No. Right? No. It ends poorly. Yeah. Says, and he said, um, if, he says, there he made a statute and an ordinance with them, and there he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God. Notice what is he calling all this? His voice. Yes. I led you. See the big, look up. See the big cloud? <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I led you, it parked right over these waters. It was me, my voice, right? He says, if you will diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight. Well, in this case, what do you think? Just go out on a limb. What do you think would have been right when they came to the waters and they found they were bitter? What would have been right? Well, maybe. maybe. I don't know that I would have thanked him, but maybe. What else? What, what? At least, at very least, to say, you know what, I understand these are bitter, and you know, and by bitter it means it's, it, they're poisonous waters. You know, they, they couldn't have physically drank the water. It's not that it just tasted bad. This was bad water. You know, kind of like swamp water that had some stuff that was dead in it. You know, not good water. Right. You know, but instead of making an assumption, they should have said, you know, and maybe it just, and God wasn't looking for. He wasn't looking for centurion faith. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the one that Jesus marveled at. He's just looking for something here, right? Just show that you trust me a little. That at least you're expecting the possibility that I might come through for you. Maybe just say out your mouth, is there something we're supposed to, to get out of this? Because I can't drink this and I'm really thirsty. Ask a question rather than make a statement, yeah. maybe. What you, you going to do now? Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just calculating in my head. You brought us out with a mighty hand. We got that. We even have a really good song made about that. And you, we crossed over on dry land and all that. We, you've got this cloud that's coverings by day and a fire by night. And by the way, thanks for the fire because it's cold out here at night. And, you know, and, and, and it's hot out here during the day, so thanks for the cloud. And, you know, you've done all this stuff. And here we are, and you let us right to bitter water. You know, I'm guessing that you're probably going to pull off one of those tricks again, right? Something. But instead they complain. Yes, you and then you. Joshua and Caleb were among this group, right? I don't know if they were born at this point yet, but they were close. Yeah, they uh, probably were. They uh, almost certainly were because this part of the journey was actually pretty short. So yes, yes, uh, they would have. Okay. They, yeah, well, they I was were. just wondering if they were among the grumblers. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm guessing if by the time they got to where they were going, they had a good heart. Um, they probably always did. But there's no guarantee. Maybe they actually just learned along the way and actually began to listen to the voice. I don't know. <clears throat> it's a good question, but not one I have an answer to. But anyway, it says, um, if you'll go, if give heed to my, my commandments and keep all my statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who, your God who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so that they camped there by the waters. It's not that God did not intend them to take them to good waters. It's not even that God wasn't able to take the bitter water and make it sweet. We saw all he did. The problem was that they didn't hear what he was saying. Right? The third time, a short while later. This isn't long again. This is a short while later. Into their journey, they were hungry. Now remember, God's still leading them. Right? In Deuteronomy 8.3, remember it tells us that uh, God said, that uh, so he humbled you and allowed you to hunger. Right? So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna to, uh, um, uh, which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might test you and make known uh, um, what was in your heart and to make man see that they shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. But what had God spoken? He'd spoken through the things he had done. He'd spoken through the things they had done. he had done. So who is it? Now God owns this. They got hungry, 
And God owned the fact that I deliberately let you go without food long enough for you to get hungry. Was God trying to starve them or be cruel to them? No. It, you, know, you know, anybody who has ate regularly, which they had, anybody that eats regularly can probably afford to miss one or two meals. It ain't going to kill you. In fact, it's probably going to be good for you, right? Yes. The benefits of fasting are well established. But he says, so I humbled you and allowed you to hunger. So it was God that did it, didn't he? It was God that was leading them. He was trying to teach them something in the hunger. What was he trying to teach them? The man doesn't live by bread alone. Don't live by your stomach. No wonder Paul, no wonder Jesus used that as an example. I want you to notice, out of some of the first things that happened with the encounters with God in the wilderness are the very things that Paul and Jesus drew from in their illustrations. Remember, Jesus said, why do you take thought over what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear? What's he pointing back to? What you guys always thought about when you're in the wilderness. What did Paul say? He says, you know what? He said, you know, I speak to you, you know, and, and, and some of you, I, I'm, I'm speaking with tears running down my face because of the fact that you have, you're, you're in love with this world and your, be and your belly is your God. <laughs> Isn't that what that was their God? What was he pointing back to? Things that was familiar things that we've all done, things that the Israelites did. So what did they believe when this happened? They said, what shall we eat? You have brought us out of this wilderness to starve us and kill us. We would have pre preferred to have been killed before the flesh pots in Egypt. But they believed it was true. They thought, you know what, it would have been better if we had, because at least there in bondage, we had plenty to eat. You brought us out to kill us. It would have been better for us. I wish that we were back there. So that was the third time that they tested God. Fourth time, God gives them manna and promises provision for each day. When he brought the manna, he brought with it a promise. He's testing them again. Notice the test is coming from who? God. He says, okay, now I'm going to feed you with manna. But I want you to pay attention. Try to hear me. And this time God's actually speaking. Only gather enough for today. I'll bring more tomorrow. Trust that. And, and then when it comes to the Sabbath, the day before, I'm going to give you enough that you can gather up twice as much. And it won't go bad. Trust that. Okay, we're going to see what happens. He rains manna. Well, we already know the story, don't we? God gives them manna and promises them provision for each day. But what do they believe? The people decide to store up and hoard up for tomorrow. Their hearts were questioning, can God really provide? Will God really provide? Tested him again. Every test that God brought to them, they threw back in his face and tested him back. The sixth one. Oh no, I'm sorry, the fifth one. Israel comes to Rephidim where no water was. This isn't just bitter water, this is no water. What did they believe? They said, why is it that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us? They, 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 this is a mantra, isn't it, of theirs? Us and our children and our livestock with thirst. So they rebelled against Moses and contended with, I'm sorry, rebelled against God and contended with Moses to the point where they nearly stoned the man. According to Moses' own words, when he went to God, he says, God, they're looking to stone me. Over water. See, there's what God is doing, and then there's what we hear. Are you guys following? Sixth time, they test God. God comes near and gives Moses the Ten Commandments. Moses was gone for a little while. What do they believe? Well, as for this Moses, we don't know what happened to him. But you know what? Well, let's do. Well, let's go ahead and make, a, uh, make ourselves a, a God and ourselves made out of gold, and it will lead us. Safely through the wilderness. Yeah. Do you realize that this whole time that they're saying this, they still have a cloud over their head? We don't hear. God was there and they did not know it. <laughs> How often is that true with us? You know what I mean? How often is it true with Mark? More than I want to admit. I'll, I'll be honest with you. We don't hear because we don't listen. That's what's I'm having with us. Yeah. And not only did they want to do that, but they also, a golden calf, and they also did it, but they at the same time were indulging in drunken sexual sin. 
at the base of the mountain, all the while covered by God's cloud. Man, there's a lesson in that, but I don't have time to teach that one. The seventh one, for no specific reason, they murmured and complained. This one, they didn't have a reason for it. You can read it. It's in Numbers, the 11th chapter, the first three verses. There was absolutely no reason for it. Not one offered. They just started complaining just because it was what they do. Right? They just started complaining. They yield, uh, and, and um, if you go a little bit further, they also yielded to intense craving for meat and held, um, and held the provision that God had given them a manna in contempt of heart. What did they believe? God would not provide their desires. So they complained, who will finally give us some meat to eat? They didn't say, it wasn't provoked in their heart through past experience of what God had done to think, you know what, Father, or even Moses, would you talk to God and find out, could we have some meat? Real grateful for the manna, but I'm kind of tired of it. I, 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 have like a, I, have a, I have a cookbook in my tent. 2,000 ways to cook manna, and I'm done. I've run out of ideas. Could we have some meat? You know, I think God would have met that. Because it's a different attitude, and it's trust, right? But instead, they loathed the manna. They held it in contempt, God's provision for them, and complained against him. That's what they heard. Sounds like us. Too many times. Yeah. I don't know where eight went, so I'm going on to nine. I, I, I skipped it someplace. Um, the ninth, uh, a ninth one is in uh, Numbers 13. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, send men, in the, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel from each tribe of their fathers. You shall send a man, each and every one, a leader among them. Then the spies returned with a mixed report. So it was not really their idea. It was God's idea to send them in. Not to spy out the land to see if they could, but to see how they could. Right? But what they came back with was, we can't. Now, now, even they had said out their own mouth to Moses, okay, we've heard what God said. We're going to go out and spy out the land to see how is the best approach to taking the land. But what they came back with was a report of, ah, it's a good land. God didn't lie about that, but he lied about everything else because we cannot take it. Right? They came back with a mixed report. But the real issue is not just what those men did. The question is, what did Israel believe? Right? God spoke to them and says, Behold, a promised land that flows with milk and honey is before you. Go in and possess it. What do they believe? We are grasshoppers and we cannot take the land. So there's what God's saying and then there's what we hear. Does anybody see what I'm saying? Yes. Faith comes by hearing, but how does God speak? Well, often, I've told you this before and I'll, I'll resort to quoting it yet, yet again. My, one of my favorite quotes from Frederick Buechner from his book entitled Now and Then, if God speaks to us at all, other than through such official channels as the Bible and church, then I think that he speaks to us largely through what happens to us. If we keep our hearts open as well as our ears, if we listen with patience and with hope, like you said a minute ago, Pam, with hope, if we remember at all deeply and honestly do you think if they had remembered deeply and honestly, they would have done half the things they did in the wilderness? No. Remember deeply and honestly, then I think we come to realize beyond our doubt that however faintly we may hear him, he is indeed speaking to us. And that however little we may understand of it, his word to each one of us is both recoverable and precious beyond the telling. Thank you. Love that quote. Yes. Love that quote. So it is entirely possible that there are many times when faith will not come for the specific because we refuse to be persuaded by the general. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. The statement? I know that some of this is a lot of a repeat from last week, but I'm going deeper by showing you how God talks. Are you seeing that? Yes. So let's look at some examples, a couple more examples before we close, okay? And I'm going to make it pretty quick here. I'm sorry? I know, I told you that I skipped over a few. Um, uh, one of them is because I erased it. It's not even on my tablet here anymore. Um, but um, I can, I can pr try to put it onto the website, uh, all ten of them. Okay? Okay. Five, I can get on that okay. I, I will put it onto the website. Okay. Um, Hebrews, I'm sorry, John chapter 10. Go ahead and turn there if you will. 
John chapter 10, starting verse 22. Let's uh, get to this and this and maybe one other verse and we're going to have to end because of our time's sake. I don't know how long we've been, uh, I've been talking, but I know that we had a fair amount of time this morning and it's getting closer to noon. So, John chapter 10, verse 22. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long will you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now Jesus already made this clear over and over and over again through the things he had done. Right? Jesus answered and said to them, I tell you, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe. Oh, listen to this, guys. He's saying, it wasn't so much just what I said, it's what I did. That was God speaking to you, and you would not listen. I think Frederick Beatner was on to something. I think maybe he's right. Maybe we ought to believe more, and not, 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 I'm not saying in lieu of, and it certainly does not replace God speaking to us through the Bible or through church or through our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not saying that. Those are, those are still important, are they not? <coughs> But so, but I think that we've robbed God from his sovereignty to the degree that we think that things that happen in our life, even if God didn't cause them, that he's not speaking through them. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm not trying to say, and I'm not going to go through your body, your life like a winter wars fan and say, okay, well, God did that one, God did that one, God did that one, he didn't do that one there, but he did that one. It doesn't matter. In the end, it really doesn't matter which ones came from God and which ones didn't. He's speaking through all of them. Yeah. Right? Yes. When, when God, when the devil intended for evil, God is turned for good. So God was speaking even through what the devil did. God is still speaking. Right? Yes. So it really doesn't matter what the source was in the end. The issue is, did I hear what he said? Yes. Right? <clears throat> and, and not all the things that happen that seem bad to you and I are all from the devil. Sometimes if you go without a meal, God is saying something. And God's the one that made you hungry. Right? We know that. We read it, didn't we? Yeah. Now, it doesn't say that God struck them with leprosy and caused their legs to fall off and he wanted to teach them or test them through that. No. He just made them go hungry for a few days. And that's, I mean, it, it didn't take leprosy and their legs falling off for them to yell at God. All it took was missing a meal. And they are royally ticked. Right? So anyway, he says, I told you and you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them union with God and they shall never perish. Neither shall, any, shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than everyone and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Skipping on down to verse 37. If I do the works of my Father, I'm sorry, if I do not do the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father has sent me and that I am in him, is in me and I am in him. If you won't believe what I've said, at least believe what I've done. Right? So do we have a basis for this? Yes. Like I said last week, Thomas may have had faith from believing, but it was still faith. Still not the man born again, right? Still he's in heaven. Still he was an effective apostle for Jesus Christ. Amen? Even though he wasn't the Peter, even though he wasn't the John, he still at least believed, didn't he? Yes. And you notice that because even though it was necessary, and it shouldn't have been, God still showed up. He called... Thomas to the mark. Here's your requirements. Right here and right here. Put your finger in my wrist. Now, I don't want you bowing down yet. Put your finger there. You said this is what you will not believe if you don't. Do it. Put your hand in my side. Right? He wouldn't let him slip on it. You say that's the requirement? Then do it. And believe. Right? And he chastised him a little bit. But he acknowledged, you believe because you've seen. 
But he, but he had it on Jesus' own lips. Same Greek word, you believe. Right? He acknowledged him. Isn't it true? I'm glad for that. Romans 1 also tells us the same thing. That's where we're going to close today. Romans 1, look at verse 16, is where we're going to start. <clears throat> Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in this message of the gospel, right standing with God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just will live by trust. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the means of faith in their unrighteousness. Now I know it doesn't say the means of faith, but that's exactly what it means. They're suppressing truth. They suppress how God's revealing himself. I mean, how many times has the word faith or belief come up already in just these three verses? A lot. A lot. That's the point, isn't it? Right? So what is it that they are suppressing by suppressing the truth? The ability to believe. Okay. Isn't it true? That's right. He says, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God himself has shown it to them. That's God's voice. It's his voice. I know they may not have heard a voice, but God was speaking. Right? So it says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. This is God saying of himself what Jesus said. If you don't believe me, believe me for the sake of all the works I did. Look at the, uh, look at the mountains, look at the birds, look at the flowers, look at, the, um, uh, uh, at the, the food and taste the food that you can eat. Breathe the air. Know that I'm good. Know that I'm God. Right? Know that you can trust me. Right? That's what he's saying here. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in God, so that they're without excuse. Not excuse for what? Not believing. There's no excuse. Because although they knew God, and this means superficially, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful but they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts gathered darkness. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Grab the light while it's near. Right? Yes. So we're going to end with that, but I want you guys to just, uh, your takeaway today, I want you to, your takeaway to be that God is speaking. Yes. He's speaking. And He's not always speaking the way that we think that He does. And, and, and without even trying, this really wasn't even difficult to find examples of God calling his actions or things that happened to people his voice. Yes. God did that. He said, that was me speaking. That was me speaking. Over there, yeah, that was me too. Sometimes God's speaking through a test. Like being hungry or coming to water that's bitter. When the negative things happen, the problem is we read that as a final statement. And it's not. These things are an invitation to come near. Come and know me better, right? So, again, we need to have that kind of heart in us. I, I tell you, uh, this past week, uh, I, I, I've taken to heart what I'm telling you to take to heart. Because, you know, whether you realize it or not, when you leave here, there will be temptation mm -hmm. over what you heard today. You need to separate yourself. Spend some time with this. Sooner rather than later. I wouldn't start on Thursday because the temptation is already hit. You smacked upside your head before that. Spend some time with it. And, 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 and mull it over in your heart. Do it in the form of worship, not as, a, not as a statement of, Lord, I want to. Say, thank you, Father, that I'm going to because I've got eyes to see and I've got ears to hear. You're not going to deposit something in my heart and then not give me the power to live it. I know this is a success going someplace to happen. I know the enemy's going to hit me, but I'm not living in fear of the enemy. Now, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not speaking that he's going to come either. I'm not concerned whether he comes or doesn't come, whether temptation comes or not. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is I'm going to be faithful of the word that you've spoken because you are able to complete that which perfect, that which concerns me. Right? And have that in your heart. Be inclined to believe. Amen? If you're not hearing his voice, believe you're going to. I'm his sheep, therefore I hear his voice. I'm going to hear I'm going to get better and better and better and better and better at this. Right? 
Amen? Amen. But, but do this because I'm telling you if you, if you, if you do not cherish the word that was planted in your heart, then you know, uh, I'm not going to go back over it, not only for time's sake, but you know them very well. You've heard it enough. You know the four hearts. You know what the temptations are. You know what the, it's going to try to come against you. It's either going to be opposition or it's going to be cares. It's going to be any of these yeah. things, right? Yes. And, uh, and all, you're, you're not your own heart's guard. You, 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 well, I mean, you protect her. You guard your heart. You don't have to protect it. God protects your heart. We saw that with, remember Egypt, Israel coming out of Egypt? He didn't even, he didn't leave them over here because he's protecting them, right? Yes. So you just trust that if temptation comes your way, God does not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. And also, will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may endure it? Amen? Just trust that going in. Just trust it going in. Just go ahead and start worshiping him. You've already, you've already been to tomorrow. You've already been on the other side of the temptation. I don't even know what the temptation is going to be, but you've been on the other side of it, and there's already victory right there. I see it. I count it, oh, joy, when the enemy tries to tempt me and pull me away from my bedrock of trust in Christ because I'm going to be blessed because I'm going to know you better. You're going to honor me with knowing you more. The enemy is just setting himself up for greater failure. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes, doors. God just spoke to my heart and said, don't be, don't be double-minded. Don't call me the Lord your shepherd and then say, I want, I'm left wanting. Yes, that's right. Because Amen. you shall not want. That's right. Amen. 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 Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that. Yes. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that yes. word. Yes. So, uh, Amen.